Good morning. Good morning. A warm welcome is extended to all. Welcome to St. Luke's Church in Cambridge, Ontario. On this rather strange morning, it was kind of dull this morning, but it looks like that sun is really trying to push out. So that's great. Our gathered presence enriches our faith lives and our time of worship. God gives us this space as a gift. Some of you are unable to join us in person. Thank you for worshiping with us on Facebook and YouTube. For those who will share in leadership and those who will share in worship, thank you. Your presence is a blessing to us all. We have a few announcements. And for the first one, there isn't a slide. My apologies, Mary. Um, many of you probably heard about the fire at the Cambridge Food Bank, um, which was unfortunate, but the community rallied round and they had things fixed within just over 24 hours. And when I was there on Thursday, we were able, able to provide milk and eggs and meat to everyone, so that really was a wonderful thing. Uh, the last day for the Broadview magazine, please see Ken for a new subscription or renewal. This Wednesday, the 17th, UCW will be holding their meeting in the Mary Clements room at 2 p.m. For fellowship and fun, all ladies are welcome. Craft supplies are needed by April 21st for camp, I'm probably not going to say this right, but Menonistung? Menonistung, perfect. Menonistung. Um, there is a list at the back of the sanctuary. It looks like this. And there are many, many, many items that a lot of people may just have hanging around at home from glue to paint supplies, coloring, crafting supplies, textiles, activities like card games, board games, books, um, egg cartons, just the bottom for planting, crafting tools like knitting needles and wool, and scrapbooking supplies. So please see what you may have at home that you can bring in to the back of the church. Thank you. April 28th, 23rd, <laughs> I can't get that. April 23rd, I insist it's the 28th, but it really is the 23rd, I apologize. From six till eight, bring a crock pot of your favorite soup and the recipe, because there will be the silver ladle to be given out to the winner of the favorite soup. If you don't feel like making soup, there's a lot of other things that you can help bring. Cheese and crackers or breads, desserts like, finger, uh, like cookies and squares. So please uh, sign up at the back of the church. Spring is here and many of us are feeling the urge to purge. So you can drop off your bagged and boxed items at the beginning of May 3rd until May 30th. Um, there are these lovely little scrolls at the back of the church with everything you need to know about it, the urge to purge, what you can bring to the church, and inside is a wonderful garbage bag for you to put all your items in, so it's very helpful. So please take one, two, three, whatever you think you may need. Take one for a friend or a neighbor. Um, May 7th, our Tuesday trucks will be starting. And Mary has prepared a volunteer sheet at the back of the church uh, for certain times to help out during the Tuesday evening. So please feel free to sign up on that sheet. And we welcome back Reverend Jenny Stevens this morning, now a very familiar face here at St. Luke's. Jenny is our pastoral charge supervisor, and we thank her for leading us in worship this morning and are very grateful to have you here, Jenny. Thank you, Joni, and I add my welcome to those of you here in the sanctuary and those of you watching uh, remotely, either live in this moment or through the week or even later than that. 
As Canadians, we experienced the Truth and Reconciliation Commission about eight years ago, and it's part of who we are as Canadians to rebuild our relationships with the Indigenous people. And we acknowledge that here in Cambridge, we are on the Haldeman Tract, which was six miles either side of the Grand River that was part of the treaties with the First Nations people. And so it's important that we say thank you to those who stewarded this land for 15,000 years and that we make a commitment to bright relations with our indigenous siblings. And so we light our Christ candle, remembering that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And our candle burning symbolizes the light that drives the darkness of despair away. Our call to worship is from the first letter of John, a couple of verses from chapter three. See what love God has lavished on us in letting us be called children of God, yet that in fact is what we are. The reason the world does not recognize us is that it never recognized God. My dear friends, now we are God's children, but it has not been revealed what we are to become in the future. We know that when it comes to light, we will be like God, for we will see God as God really is. And let us pray together. Jesus Christ, our Savior, alive and at large in the world, help us to follow and find you today in the places where we work and meet people, spend leisure time and make plans. Teach us to see through your eyes and to hear the questions you ask by the power of the cross and in the freedom of your spirit, we pray. Amen. And so let us stand as we're able to sing our opening hymn, Voices United 161, for those who are grabbing your hymn books at home, perhaps. Welcome, happy morning.
Please pray with me. Calm us now, O Lord, into a quietness that heals and listens. Open wounded hearts to the balm of your word. Speak to us in clear tones so that we might feel our spirits leap for joy and skip with hope as your resurrection witnesses. Amen. The scripture reading this morning is taken from Luke chapter 24. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering. He said to them, have you anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still here with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to, is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Words for the church today. Thanks be to God.
And where do you see the love of God? In one another? And so we offer the peace of Christ with one another. The peace be with you and also with you. So however you want to greet one another, peace be with you. Thank you, Andrew. Peace be with you. We'll sing again, and those who would like to stand can do this, do so, and those who would like to sit can stay seated. So the church is wherever God's people are praising, singing God's goodness for joy on this day. So the three-year-old girl was heard on the nursery monitor saying to her baby brother, tell me about God, I forget. How is it that we come to know the divine? How is it that we come to know God in our lives? So a friend of mine tells the story of as a very young girl getting herself locked in the bathroom and you can imagine the panic that she felt and the adults through the door trying to instruct her to you know go to the door handle and here's the lock and you know there was just no way she was going to be able to do that and she just felt so disconnected um, from her mom that finally her mom got down on her hands and knees on the other side of the bathroom door and slid her fingers underneath the gap in the door you know, underneath is usually just, just a little bit like this, and said, Jean, slide your fingers in underneath and you can feel mine. So tip to tip under the door, they touched each other so that they knew that connection while father went around with a ladder and ended up climbing in the bathroom window um, to free her from the bathroom. There's something about touch and we heard in the scripture Jesus appearing to the disciples in the upper room and saying, touch and see. So I wonder how you've been experiencing the divine in your lives. I was thinking about my own life because we need these people to both tell us about God and to touch us in some way in a, in a way that reminds us of the divine. Maybe like many of you, I grew up as a kid in the 60s, and I was British. I grew up in Wembley, Middlesex, and went to Park Lane Methodist Church in Wembley. And, you know, the 60s were booming times, right, for, for our congregations, doesn't matter which country you're in. It was a time of uh, big activity. And of course, in a suburb of London, there was a high population and lots of programs going on in the church, Boys Brigade and Girl Guides and Sunday School and Sunday School classes for each particular age. You know, there were more than 100 people in the Sunday School, 100 of us in the Sunday School, lots of, lots of teachers. 
Um, my father was a lay preacher, civil servant by profession, but preached uh, equivalent now would be the licensed lay worship leaders. And my mother was the first female society steward. So like Joni would be standing up doing the announcements and that kind of thing. And my grandmother sang in the choir and the choir was at the back of the church up in the balcony. And this is the days before microphones. And as an 11 year old, I was asked to read scripture. My dad took me up on Saturday and stood me at the lectern. So similar to here, there was a pulpit and a lectern. So he stood me at the lectern and said, remember grandma can't hear very well. And she's up at the back and had me practice reading, which I think has actually stood me in good stead now that we do have microphones, because you still have to throw your voice a little bit. And for me, it was just kind of a community. I don't know that I really thought as a real young person about connecting with God, but we were active um, serving meals uh, with the Wembley Stadium. You will have seen games from Wembley Stadium, so that's the area I grew up in. And so the church used to put on meals for all the football fans coming to the big events. And so as guides and Sunday school members, we would be with trays, clearing tables and everything. So we had grew up with a sense of service. And also uh, there were a lot of women around who looked after the little ones. So my mother was in young wives group. And so we had all these aunties in the congregation. We also had something called Eisteddfods. So in the Methodist church, congregations are grouped by circuits and there would be a circuit I steadfast with all these activities. So cake baking, a bit like your, your fairs now. And the, so for the adults, there would be carpentry, um, sculpting. You could put in all kinds of arts and crafts, as well as other kinds of activities. And for we kids, we could do all kinds of things too, including going into a scripture reading competition where you didn't know what you were going to be presented with. And I, the story is told, I think it's true, but I think my grandmother enjoyed it way too much, <laughs> that I was presented with the scripture uh, about the storm on the lake. And apparently I said, Jesus, Jesus, we are stinking. <laughs> Somewhere in there, in the service, in the community, in the sense of love from all the adopted aunties in the congregation, uh, from the worship, because we would have a family service once a month and as a brownie and then a guide, there would be church prayed associated with that. Somewhere in there, I felt the touch of the divine. You know, when you hit 11 or 12, you're invited to, in Methodist terms, join the church. Um, here, I think we talk about confirmation, more than that, confirming our baptismal vows. And I felt I wasn't sure I was ready because the faith I had was my mum and dad's faith and not necessarily mine. So it took me a few years to actually articulate what my own faith was and to own for myself that the community, the incarnated body of Christ, um, was actually touching me in an inward way and a sense of the divine. So I suspect it's a relatively common experience that we get to meet God through other people. And in the story that we have today, the resurrection appearance that we have today, when you read those last couple of chapters in Luke's gospel, you have these series, three resurrection appearances, or three pieces of the story um, prior to Jesus' ascension. Of course, they all thought they'd had to let him go at the crucifixion, and then the resurrection appearance, he reappears, but then they ultimately do need to let him go uh, when he ascends uh, to sit on the right hand of God is the image that we have. and. But in between, there's resurrection, not resuscitation, resurrection and a, a, these appearances of Jesus. So in Luke's gospel, you have the women going to the tomb 
and what they see are angels. And the angels say, what are you looking for? Don't you know that he's gone? He told you he, was, he, he would rise again on the third day. Like, don't you get it? Like, you know, the tomb is empty. And then they run and tell the disciples who have gathered back in the upper room, where presumably they stayed for the whole Passover, and, you know, the Last Supper, Monday, Thursday, uh, where they had the Passover meal with Jesus. And, of course, the guys said, oh, that's an idle tale. That's just the women spinning tales. And so Peter had to run back. And when he looked in the tomb, he didn't see angels. He saw folded linen. And then, so then he runs back and reports. And then you have this story of the road to Emmaus. So two people walking home to a village probably about seven miles outside of Jerusalem. And a stranger joins them on the road and gets a talking about, well, why are you so sad? And they say, well, don't you know what's been happening? This person we thought would release us from the oppression of the Romans has been crucified. And now there's, there's these weird stories that, you know, there's the empty tomb and there's all of this. And, and this stranger explains to them the meaning of the scripture. They invite him into their home and he's made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Suddenly they recognize that it's Jesus. So they go back and tell their stories. So you've got these three different pieces of story and then the scripture that Joni read, where in the midst of them trying to puzzle out what all these stories mean. So the women see angels, the men see folded linen in an empty tomb, and Cleopas and his wife are reporting this story of Jesus' resurrection and appearance and the stranger being made known to them in the breaking of the bread. And into that space comes Jesus. And Jesus is, and they were scared, right? Because they didn't really expect this person who kind of looked like someone they knew, but was it a ghost or what was this? And he's saying, well, look at me. It, it's me. I'm not a ghost. Look, the wounds in my hands, the wounds in my feet. And do you have something to eat? And then he eats broiled fish that they have given him. Touch and see is the invitation. I hadn't thought before about how close the message of Christmas is to the message of Easter. Sometimes I think we think they're kind of separate understandings of God. You know, the message of Christmas, that Jesus is born, that God is born in the flesh of this baby, and God lives in the life of Jesus, this resurrection appearance is exactly the same message, right? Here I am in the body. Look at my hands and my feet. You know, let's eat together in the flesh. You know, how do we meet the divine? We meet the divine through one another, through the tangibility of the word made flesh, through the embodied nature of the love of God. Now, behind the scenes, Reverend Helen Pryor and I have been planning this service, and she's going to finish the sermon for us. So I'm wondering what this means for you, Helen. Christ's peace be with you, and may it remain with you always. Just to fill in the blanks, I just realized that some people may not recognize that I was the person who was supposed to be becoming your minister January 1st, and that just didn't quite work out. And like Jenny, I had a, a lot of people... You want me to hold this too? Okay. Who bore witness to me with Christ's love. But I'm living in a really strange time right now. I know that my life expectancy is not long, and I'm reaching the end of my journey, and I've been given a gift. People are saying thanks to me for my witness of Christ's love to them. And it's been a very amazing gift. It's been humbling and surprising. 
But in every instance where people are talking about they experience God's love, it wasn't the big events. It wasn't anything splashy or grandiose. What I heard every time was people saying, you were there, you were present, you showed up, you just loved us and helped us feel accepted for who we are. So I, I have to say to you that I truly felt called to be your minister at St. Luke's. Everything I saw about this church, how you worked and how you worshiped, how you shared in fellowship together, made me feel like we could have a great time of joy and energy and life together. So I was looking for that journey, looking forward to that journey. And never getting to be your leader has been a great disappointment. But even so, I understand that Jesus, with his disciples wanting to leave instructions and directions, I'm still in that boat. I still want to leave you with directions and instructions. Because the first thing I want to say is, I've seen who you are. I have witnessed who you are as the body of Christ, who you are as a church. Now, maybe it's because of all the drugs I'm on to keep me going, but I can't remember any of the published phrases about your mission statements or anything like that. But you guys live out some very obvious values. You're inclusive. You're welcoming. You're loving. And that's who you are at your core. You bear witness when you're chatting with folks at the food trucks. You bear witness to God's love when you're sitting together at the fireside chats or at the spaghetti dinners. And Barb and I have experienced this firsthand when you had such ease of embracing us or any new people, welcoming them in at worship and at, at events. In all of these things, you embody the love of God, and you do this well. You do this so well. This is who you are, and this is valuable and worth protecting. When challenges come, I want to encourage you to stay centered and focused on who you are, and I want to encourage you to say, like, if you focus on who you are, everything else will be fine. If I had been privileged enough to be your minister for a long time, you would have heard me say ad nauseum over and over and over again that Christ's call is as simple as this, that, that God wants us to live fully, to love abundantly, and become all that God created us to be. Think back to the, the great commandment. Jesus says love. Love God, and then love your neighbor as yourself. It's that simple. Be loving, and love will make all the difference. Amen. In that desire to keep it simple, I would invite you to join with me in singing the hymn, Tis a Gift to be Simple. Number, I don't have it with me, so.
So our offering will now be received. And we're grateful for all the gifts that come to St. Luke's United Church, the gifts that come to help the food bank recover from the fire, the many ways that you contribute to the world around in very meaningful ways and embody God's love for others. And so we sing as the offering is brought forward. Loving God, we offer to you our time, our talents, and our love, knowing that our love comes from the source of love, yourself. And so bless these gifts and all the things we do each day and every day in your name. Amen. Please be seated. And as we come together to raise our prayers, I would remind you of the people that are, will be listed on the screen that we hold in our hearts. Let us come before God with our prayers. Loving God, elusive and faithful friend, in spite of our scrappy faith, we dare to celebrate your glorious presence. You're an all-sustaining friend in spite of the negative events in the world around us. We dare to celebrate your presence. When many feel your absence, we thank you for your attempts to break through, to nurture us. We give thanks for scriptures that speak your truth, even when our hearts feel cold. We give thanks for the caring faith communities where we're gifted with encouragement and healing. We give thanks for the, those special holy times when for a few seconds this world's shroud splits open and we get a glimpse of your glory. Most of all, God, we give thanks for the gift of Christ Jesus who makes himself known to us as a companion and guide. God, in this world where hopes are so often dashed and dreams so often broken, we remember the faith that was stirred in so many hearts, both through Christ's coming, his living, loving, and teaching, and through his resurrection from the dead. We remember how news spread from the tomb to, to the upstairs room, to the Emmaus Road, then to the Sea of Galilee, and the dream was born again and again in the smoldering embers, and faith was rekindled. It's through the risen Christ that we're reminded, God, that you come to us in unexpected places, in crowded rooms, on long, dusty roads, in conversation, but also in stillness. You come in the midst of our doubts and our fears and our sorrows. No pain nor suffering is unknown to you. You bring peace. And so we pray for the places where there is no peace. We pray for countries torn apart by war. We pray for refugees seeking homes. We pray for prisoners facing torture. We ask that you bring peace to the tensions and conflicts that are within us. 
the regrets, maybe the failures or broken relationships or lost friendships. God, we're bombarded with images every day that shape our attitudes and behaviors. Open our eyes once again to behold you in our world, in the beauty of nature, in the beauty of other human beings, in the beauty of all that is sacred. And in our seeing, help us to recognize and welcome the strangers in our midst. We take time now to pray for all who are sick, those who are recovering from illness, those who are grieving or frightened or isolated or lonely. Hold all those whose lives feel shattered by grief in the embrace of your loving spirit. And we take time now to hold before you those listed on the screen and those we carry in our thoughts, in our hearts. God of love, we pray that your love might be felt wherever faith has dwindled and dreams have faded. Just as spring is bursting forth, may hope flower again. We pray, God, that you might come again in your living power. And we pray this into being as we pray the words Jesus taught, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. And just before we start singing, I would like to thank Jenny for providing this opportunity for me to uh, edge in on her service. I was going to start with the joke of saying, is the front of the sanctuary big enough for the two of us? <laughs> but she has made that space, and I give her thanks for that. Let us join together in singing hymn number 158. Christ is alive.
As we leave this place and go back out into the world, let us continue to embody the love of God moment by moment in all that we do and go with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit with each and every one of you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.